Our first reading today for the 22nd Sunday in Ordinary Time is a reading from the book of Sirach. My child, conduct your affairs with humility and you will be loved more than a giver of gifts. Humble yourself the more, the greater you are, and you will find favor with God. What is too magnificent for you, seek not. Into things beyond your strength, search not. The mind of a sage appreciates proverbs, and an attentive ear is the joy of the wise. Water quenches a flaming fire, and alms atone for sins. The word of God. The psalm response today is, God, you have made a home for the poor. The just rejoice and exult before God. They are glad and rejoice. Sing to God, chant praise to the Lord, whose name is Yahweh. A parent to the orphan and protector of the defenseless is our God who dwells in holiness. God creates families for those who are alone and leads captives to freedom. God, you have made a home for the poor. A bountiful rain you showered down, O God, upon your inheritance. You restored the land when it languished. Your flock settled in it. In your goodness, O God, you provided for the needy. Made a home for the poor. The second reading is a reading from the letter to the Hebrews. Brothers and sisters, what you have come to is nothing known to the senses, not a blazing fire or a gloomy darkness or a storm or a trumpet blast or a voice speaking words such that those who heard begged that no message be further addressed to them. No, you have approached Mount Zion and the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and countless angels in festal gathering, and the assembly of the firstborn enrolled in heaven, and God, the judge of all, and the spirits of the just made perfect, and Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and the sprinkled blood that speaks more eloquently than that of Abel. The word of God. Thanks be to God. May God be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. <laughs> That's what I say too. <laughs> On a Sabbath, Jesus went to dine at the home of one of the leading Pharisees and the people there were observing him carefully. He told the parable to those who had been invited, noticing how they were choosing the seats of honor at the table. When you are invited by someone to a wedding banquet, do not recline at table in the place of honor. A more distinguished guest than you may have been invited. And then the host who invited both of you may approach and say, give your place to this guest. And then you would proceed with embarrassment to take the lowest place. Rather, when you are invited, go and take the lowest place so that the host may come to you and say, friend, come up higher. Then you will enjoy the esteem of your companions at the table. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, but those who humble themselves will be exalted. Then Jesus said to the host who invited him, when you hold a lunch or a dinner, do not invite your friends and your siblings and your relatives and your rich neighbors in case they may invite you back and then you would be repaid. Rather, when you hold a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind. Blessed indeed will you be 
because of their inability to repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. The Gospel of the Lord. In 2006, Stephen Colbert, who then ran the satirical news show, The Colbert Report, was invited to be the keynote speaker at the White House Correspondents' Dinner, which, as you know, is a big gathering of major politicians and big names in the media and celebrities and always the sitting president. He was a strange choice, given that this was in the Bush administration and Colbert had been a very outspoken critic of the president, especially the decision to invade Iraq. So why was he the pick for the guest of honor? Well, probably because of his notoriety at the time. Of course, he was wildly popular. He was beloved by people. And one in 10 young adults then named Colbert as their most trusted news source. So even the, the White House was a little curious about him, even though their views were diametrically opposed. Well, you can imagine the expectations that the staffers probably had. They probably figured, well, yeah, this guy's been a thorn in our side, but look what we've done here. We've given him the place of honor. We've given him this coveted high-profile speaking engagement, so maybe he'll tone down what he says just for today. Maybe he'll at least just kind of skip over the war. That would be nice. Colbert took the microphone, greeted everybody warmly, and proceeded to give one of the strongest anti-war speeches ever written while sitting about three feet from the president. And he did all this, of course, in a clever way. He stayed in character as his television personality the whole time, which made it harder for him to get tossed out. Today, Jesus is invited to the home of one of the leading Pharisees. This is something that should strike us as a little strange, right? This should catch our attention. He's a peculiar choice because we know he's been an outspoken critic of the Pharisees all along the way. So maybe this group of powerful people had heard about how popular he was and how beloved and trusted. Even they seem to have been a little bit curious about him. Even people who find Jesus puzzling or frustrating at times can still be curious about him. At the same time, Luke tells us that they were watching him closely so they're suspicious. They're waiting for him to say something controversial so they can turn him in. But maybe they thought that he would tone down what he had been saying all along the way, or at least the parts that, that they objected to, which was, had a lot to do with Jesus hanging out with all the people they thought of as the wrong people, and how he kept insisting that everybody, everybody is unconditionally loved by God. They thought, well, maybe he'll skip over that part. Maybe he'll soften that a little bit, because here we've given him this seat of honor at the table. But no such luck, as we see. Jesus tells a story critiquing the Pharisees, all the while proclaiming the same things he's been preaching all along. And he does this in kind of a clever way, so it's hard for them to toss him out. This is a balance a lot of us have to strike in some part of life, anyway. We want to speak up. We want to have integrity. We want to stay true to what's right. But in one way or another, we find that there's some kind of line that we have to walk because of a, a power structure that's in the picture somehow. One Roman Catholic parish that I know that I respect very much uh, normally has a beautiful liturgy with inclusive language, a lot like we have here. In their sermons, they call for the ordination of women. They open and close every liturgy with prayers that acknowledge the indigenous land they stand on. Over time, they decided to drop the creed, finding that it just wasn't as deeply meaningful for folks in the pews anymore. Uh, the prayers and the rubrics, as we have done, they made more accessible and understandable. So this is their liturgy as I had always known it. Well, one week, they found out that the bishop was going to be dropping by. And that Sunday, I walked in, and there had been a transformation, and not in a good way. The language had all changed back. The sermon lost all its radicalism. The creed had returned. There it was, up on the screen. Never seen it before in this parish. And the prayers were back to the old, strict-sounding sorts of language. And I don't, I don't mean to be too hard on them, because I imagine what they figured was Look, we, we can't get ourselves thrown out. How can we keep speaking up 
if we cross the line and get expelled. So we have to tone things down because of who is watching. And it could be they were right. It could be that that decision kept them at the table so they could keep agitating from within the church. And we need people to do that. At the same time, when I see this, I can't help but think, it's no wonder the church does not change. In any case, we all have a tightrope walk like this somewhere in our life. And we have to find that balance between being challenging and being skillful enough that we can say things in a way that people don't slam the door on us. So Jesus finds a beautiful way of doing that here. Instead of calling out these high-profile companions directly, he speaks in a parable. He gets his point across indirectly by seeming to talk about something else. Xander Moritz was the president of his high school class in Florida this year. You might have heard Lauren Fry also talk about him in a recent homily. In his graduation speech, he planned to speak about his LGBTQ activism and his struggles growing up as a gay teen. When the school administration learned about this, they decided it would constitute a violation of Florida's so-called don't say gay law, which forbids discussion of sexual orientation in public school. And they informed Xander that if he spoke about any of this in his speech, his microphone would be cut off. The school officials would be watching him closely. Xander got to the podium and he made this opening statement. He said, I must discuss a very public part of my identity. The crowd drew in its breath, fearing the worst. He went on, this characteristic has probably become the first thing you think of when you think of me as a human being. You could hear a pin drop. I have curly hair. <laughs> Took off his graduation cap to show the audience. I used to hate my curls, he said. I used to spend mornings and nights embarrassed by them, trying to straighten this part of myself. But the daily damage of trying to fix myself became too much to endure. So I decided to be proud of who I was, proud of my curls, and I started coming to school as my authentic self. And the speech went on like this from beginning to end. He never directly mentioned sexual orientation. As instructed by his principal, he didn't use the word gay once. But everybody got the picture. So Jesus seems to be talking about a dinner party. This is kind of a mundane thing, this question of table etiquette and place settings. But of course, just underneath the surface, it's about a lot more than that. This isn't really about the arrangement of a table. This is about the rearrangement of the world in God's kingdom. If you've ever planned a banquet or a wedding reception, you know what a fraught kind of thing this can be. And the big question is always, who sits with whom? We think we're going to outgrow this question when we don't have a, a high school cafeteria and lunch tables in our lives anymore. But you may have noticed it keeps recurring. It keeps popping up at work, in social gatherings, sometimes even in churches. It's really everywhere, this question of what are the cliques going to be? Who's going to sit at the head of the table? Who has to be near or far from whom? Who would absolutely never sit with who? Who has the power seats and who's at the slush table? Jesus, in his indirect, clever way, calls out how stuck the Pharisees are in this way of thinking, and he gives them some advice. He says, instead of getting caught up in all this, do these two things anywhere you go in life. Take the lowest place, and whenever you gather people, Instead of inviting your friends and your relatives and your rich neighbors, I like how the gospel says that. In other words, the ones who can do something for you, the ones who are just like you, the people you normally always invite, invite the excluded instead. The people always left off the guest list, the folks who not only don't get the seat of honor, but usually don't even get an invitation. That's who you reach out to. Father Jim often talks about Luke as Spiritus Christi's gospel, and it seems to me like this is Spiritus Christi's passage, because these two things are really pivotal for us. This is what we try to live by. Take the lowest place, 
Stand with the marginalized, no matter who that is. Whenever somebody's bullied or mistreated or not counted, that's where you must go. That's the place you must stand. And inclusion, invite everybody in, especially the people who have habitually been left out. We often say, we are here for those who are not here. We hope this can be a home for anybody who has not found one yet in the institutional church. So the real invitation here is to this whole way of life, of outreach and inclusion. And notice Jesus doesn't say, do these things because if you don't, you're a terrible person. Or do this out of a sense of duty, just grit your teeth and, and get through it. Or do this because deep down, maybe you're still a little bit afraid of hell. Or do this because Catholic guilt. No, no. He says, blessed are you if you do this. This is going to make you happy. That's the great secret. Blessed are you. Friday night, we had the first ever bowling party as a fundraiser for grace of God. <laughs> Many of you guys were there. It was a beautiful gathering from people from all over the parish, all the different masses. And the outreaches, big crew from Nielsen House was there and religious ed, and small Christian communities, and Mother Earth, and there were people from beyond the parish, just people of all ages and different life experiences. And I was looking around, bowlers and non-bowlers, and I thought, how many places does this happen anymore? Where else can you see this kind of beautiful hodgepodge of people all in one place? It's like Jesus came by and got a hold of the party planner's list of place cards and shuffled them all, scrambled them so people who would absolutely never have crossed paths otherwise had this chance to just meet each other and talk and eat pizza and have fun. This is what we can expect as followers of the Lord. This is what being a disciple of Jesus brings into your life, you may have noticed. Jesus scrambles our friend group, throws the doors open, and fills up our life with people we would never have chosen or invited in ourselves. And beautiful things happen. Everything becomes a party. It wouldn't be the same without everybody in this wild mixed group of people that just got thrown together by the Lord. Blessed are we when we show up for the poor. Blessed are we when we invite those we wouldn't normally think to hang out with. Blessed are we, as Father Greg Boyle says, that's where the joy happens. For those of you who volunteer at Dimitri House or Isaiah House, why do you do that? For the glory of it? For the honor of it? No, for the joy. Why do our buddy readers go into city schools? Why does speaking from the heart get together and spend time helping refugees learn English? Why do we go to Haiti? Why do we go to Chiapas? Out of guilt? No. Out of duty? No. Out of joy, we go because that's where the joy is. Blessed are we. So today, Jesus urges us to be both courageous and wise as we find ways to speak our truth to the world. He calls us to a happy life of befriending all the wrong people, just like God does. And he reminds us that God's dream for the world is a banquet where the motto is, here comes everybody. The deepest meaning of Catholic, here comes everybody. Once, a greedy royal official asked St. Lawrence to turn over to him all the treasures of the church. He expected Lawrence to bring him bags and bags of gold and silver and coins. Lawrence went out into the streets, reaching out to all the people religion had usually slammed its doors against. He came back and he met this official with a crowd standing behind him of agnostics and questioners Homeless people, struggling people, debtors, grief-stricken people, the quirky, the timid, the doubtful. The official stood there blustering and said, Lawrence, what is this? What are you up to? What are you doing? Where are the treasures of the church? And the saint opened his arms wide to indicate this beautiful mix of people and said proudly, here they are.
Cross that we bear.